Tesla has always been that stock, to be honest. It's always been that stock that made these incredible runs that makes the bear say, this is ridiculous bubble. This has to crash. This has to come down. What is going on, right? It's always been that stock. When you look at some of these moves the stock has made since it went public back in uh, 2010 or 2011 when Tesla went public, right? And you look back to some of these moves the stock made in past years, they're shocking. And they're like, that stock went up hundreds of percent in a snap of fingers, you know, a thousand percent in a matter of, you know, two years and just mind blowing. But Tesla's that sort of stock. It's one of those stocks that, you know, it's down and out for a bit, maybe a year, maybe two years. It's not doing anything. It seems dormant. And then it just goes on this crazy run. And obviously coming off of 2014, all the way through basically the first half of 2019, that stock didn't go anywhere for five, six years. You know, it went up it went down it went nowhere. And then it made this absolutely massive move. And so we could definitely be at a moment if the economy stays decent, that we could be at a, uh, in another moment right now that's making this epic move that people are just going to be shocked by. And other stocks are like that. It's not the only stock in the market. NVIDIA comes to mind, which is always obviously on top of everybody's mind. NVIDIA is so overvalued. It's a bubble. They, you know, I hear them on TV. They've been saying that since it was 150. Then it was 200, 250, 300, 400 plus now. And um yeah, it, because the stock's going up so much doesn't mean always it's a bubble. It just means people are realizing it's a bigger opportunity than some folks realized before. Mm, definitely. And I think the charging infrastructure play is, is kind of this moment where Wall Street or the general public's realizing, you know, this really could be a huge opportunity here in Tesla. So we've had these announcements from Ford and GM. Do you think all EV companies or all legacy auto is going to have to pile in and, and join them here? Ooh, that's a great question. That is a great question. It's a potential. I don't think it's all going to happen right now, but it could definitely play out over the next few years because the way I'm thinking about this is, especially with Ford and GM now wanting to jump on the super uh, Tesla supercharger network, is we know Tesla's always building more superchargers. And the way of view with Tesla building more superchargers is it gives them even a bigger moat and moat and moat around that business because they have even more locations, more, uh, you know, just chargers in a, in a particular location where, you know, it might have been at this restaurant or whatever. They had four, then they have six, then they have eight, then they have 10. And so the more jump on Tesla Supercharger Network, the more I think our others are going to also jump on because they're going to realize, damn, they just got them everywhere. They've got the most capability. And it's, it's a bad financial decision for us not to jump on to the Tesla supercharger network. So Elon's are playing a high, a high level game of checkers, or excuse me, a chess. Elon's playing a high level game of chess in this whole situation. And I think a lot of folks are um, not realizing uh, the level he's playing at. And it's, it's brilliant, man. It's the, it's, a, it's such an Elon move. The, the, you know, we've seen the Ford announcement, seen that GM announcement just made me say, gosh, that is such an Elon move. That is beautiful. Mm, yeah, I think it's quite a landmark moment as well, because now Tesla is making service margins off vehicles they didn't even produce. I just I think that is crazy. Do you think this could maybe pave the way for Tesla to have FSD partnerships in the future? Ooh, that's a good question, too. I think that definitely is a potential because that's another technology that, let's be honest, almost every company is massively behind and it's basically just hoping somebody solves it so they can adapt their technology in their cars let's let's just be honest about that okay and so as tesla has that it's definitely i think it's definitely a potential um that tesla could go that route if they want to go that route but you know there's always been a lot of talk about these different kind of concepts and what tesla could do and how much they want to partner with others and in all these sorts of things and i remember there used to be talk about the skateboard, like basically Tesla selling the bottom of a car to all the other auto manufacturers and auto, other auto manufacturers putting their kind of bodies on and, and kind of doing things that way. So there's a lot of capabilities, you know, Tesla doing major partnerships for batteries potentially in the future. There's so much there. It's just a question of what does Tesla want to actually give up versus not? What is What does Elon really view as core technology that he's just absolutely not willing to partner with versus it makes financial sense? And, you know, it's not uncommon for companies to partner with even their competition. A good example of this in an industry is Samsung. You know, almost every single time you buy an iPhone, you're actually giving money to Samsung because usually there's different Samsung components in an iPhone. And so I think, you know, that's always been a kind of a brilliant thing that Samsung does because they're in many different business lines and they help a lot of other companies succeed, right? But 
it's it's funny because it, I'm almost viewing Tesla as like it's Apple, but it's also Samsung. And so it's kind of a, a beautiful thing they got going on there. But um, yeah, I, the, the potential there is just massive for them to partner if if Elon wants to go that route. When you think about FSD from a financial point of view moving forward, obviously the robo taxi opportunity, it's fun to run the numbers, bit of a pipeline dream. And, you know, we know from your perspective, you don't necessarily model all of that. But do you think from a level four or a level three autonomy point of view, that's kind of certain we're going to be getting at least around there. That's a massive subscription opportunity, especially when you consider all the safety features which could come along with a car operating high level three or level four level. Do you think that's kind of in the bag for Tesla and that alone will be a massive revenue and profit driver moving forward? Yeah, there's no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt that there's going to be a major profit driver specifically, even more so than revenue, in my opinion, because obviously, you know, the tech's built out and then it's just like straight profit for Tesla when they sell that. But what I think is going to be bigger for Tesla long term is what I think is going to happen is I think the majority of people that use FSD, true FSD, right? The whole deal, the holy, the holy real deal, holy field. That's going to be folks that, in my opinion, are going to be paying a monthly fee for that to use that. And right now, I believe Tesla charges, I think it's $199 a month to have that capability. I really think it could be extremely compelling at $99. I know a lot of people have trouble paying that $199 a month uh, because obviously some people just have the money like that. It's like, who cares? Like, But a lot of people, the masses, $199 a month might be a little much. So if, if Tesla could ever bring it down to actually $99 a month, I think this would be almost a no-brainer where almost every single person that has a Tesla would be like, less than a hundred bucks a month to have true FSD in my car, I'm going to get that. And that goes right onto that services line item again. And that's a recurring revenue stream. And the most beautiful business models in the world are ones that have recurring revenue streams, Amazon Web Services, Intuit with what they have with QuickBooks, right? TurboTax products, uh, Adobe, what Adobe has in their product suite. These are some of the best business models in the world. Apple even because of their services business and you know always just you, you're recurring I pay for Apple music every month and Apple cloud and all this different stuff right and I don't even know I'm being charged for <laughs> it's 10 bucks here 20 bucks there those are the best business models and so I can see with Tesla there I think that's going to be the bigger opportunity because not everybody wants to dish out of pocket seven thousand ten thousand dollars whatever for this FSD that they haven't even probably really tried that much that they're like I don't know about this the, the people that are super like into technology, they'll get it and have a lot of money, right? But a lot of other people are like $7,000, $10,000, $12,000 extra. I don't know about that. Oh, 99 bucks a month if they ever did that. That is a much easier sell because then you're just trying it. Um, $199, you know, $299, ah, so it gets a little tough. One thing I definitely learned as Tesla were lowering their prices is the lower the price, there's then an exponential increase in demand. This is for the, the car prices. Elon says the value of FSD is high. That's why he's pricing it high. But I think you're right there. I think moving it from 199 to 99 could like, that could like 10x demand. And then that makes financial sense. At the end of the day, Elon will always make the best decision long term. But my thought is it's got to be the value proposition to people has to be so compelling. A lot of people do still like to drive. And a lot of people feel like they probably don't really need FSD that much. So like every once in a while, it might be nice. If you live in LA, you might love it. If you live in New York City, you might love it. A very congested city that has a lot of traffic. But for a lot of people, they're like, ah, I don't know, man. And so it, the, the value there has to be so compelling that it makes people say, you know what? This is amazing. I'm willing to pay for this. And um, that, that's, 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 a, that's when you have a true success. And you look at even Tesla's vehicles. Tesla gives you the best bang for the buck for any auto manufacturer in the world now at this point in time. When you look at what they're doing with Model 3, Model Y, the value is so compelling. And so it doesn't really matter what, what Elon thinks or what we think in terms of this technology is so amazing. You should pay a, a lot of money for this. At the end of the day, it comes down to what is a customer willing to pay for that? Are they willing to pay $3,000 a year to utilize that technology or are they willing to pay $1,200 a year? A hundred bucks a month, two hundred bucks a month, three hundred bucks a month. Yeah, my 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 thought process is when you get under that hundred that hundred price point, I think that's when you can really get a lot of people to say, "I can tell you, I don't have full FSD on either of my Teslas, right? Why don't I have it? Well, if it was ninety nine, damn it, I would, I would. 
I don't have it right now, but I can tell you if, if tomorrow Tesla put it at 99 bucks, I'm putting it on both the cars. Something to think about, Elon. It's a parallel universe. Jeremy Lefebvre is working at Quick Trip in 2023, and he's just figured out what this thing, the stock market is going on, and you've got a thousand bucks to invest. And a little bit of, you know, monthly reoccurring uh, savings you can add to the stock market going forward. You've got a thousand bucks. What do you spend it on? So first thing is for the newer investors, I mean, income expenses. You, you mentioned it had some recurring revenue. Like you've got to have more income than expenses. It's such an over, it's, it's one of the most important things to be in a successful investor, but it's so overlooked. If you don't have more income than expenses every month, You've got to get fix that ASAP if you want to be an actual stock market investor, because there's no worse feeling than stocks going down, the market going down, you seeing a great opportunity, not being able to buy that opportunity because you've got more expenses than income or you've got nothing at the end of each month. You better have money. OK, so I think mean, that just needs to be said off the front. So if I'm a new investor, the thing I would focus on is value stocks first, which is the same route I went value stocks and dividend stocks. And I know every a lot of people when they first get in the market especially a lot of younger folks in the newer generation, they like to just go straight to the, the growth stocks, right? I want, I want this and this, uh, the growth, the growth. But at the end of the day, value and dividend stocks are so much easier to wrap your head, head around as a newer investor. And the reason being is they usually have very consistent business models. They have relatively easy to predict financials, P ratios that are usually uh, very easy to understand. With growth investing, especially for a lot of newer investors, unless you get in at a kind of a perfect time, right? Which after you've gone through kind of a crash, you usually have a very good time as a beginner, which leads to too much confidence. So let's say, for instance, there were some people that got in right after the Rona crash of 2020 and they bought in some growth stocks and then they thought they were geniuses, right? And then obviously in this most recent crash we had, some folks have definitely bought some growth stocks and they think they, they know it all now and they don't need to, you know, uh, upgrade their game. You know, that's usually danger, danger, danger. Start with value stocks, start with dividends, get your head around those, figure out how to run valuations on those companies, figure out if you're getting a good deal or not a good deal, be able to look back at the history of these stocks, be able to look at competitors. It's so much easier to judge, you know, a, a Procter & Gamble versus XYZ company that has, you know, 45% growth expected next year, but last year they revenue shrunk 20% for some crazy reason. And uh, this year, no one knows what they're going to do for numbers, right? But once, once I get that role and I buy a few stocks, buy maybe three, four stocks to get started in the market with that first thousand bucks, you can maybe divvy it up, you know, four stocks, 250 bucks a pop, right? And some of these value dividend stocks, as you get more experience, more knowledge, more understanding of how to run financials, projections, what's a fair PE, what's a fair forward PE, what's a good balance sheet versus a bad balance sheet, income statements and things like that. Now, now we can at least start to approach some more of the growth stocks, right? Some more of the companies that businesses are maybe a little more of a roller coaster ride that's not as consistent. But make sure you get that foundation work first because it's like, you know, I come from the sports world way before I was ever a stock market investor, right? And so in sports, you build your body a specific way in the off season for success. You don't just go straight in in the off season and start, you know, doing max bench press and max squat or something like that. Like you don't, you don't train your body that way. You actually start with usually your core and any a good coach out there is always going to get you to get in good shape, get your endurance in, get in, you know, get your core right. And then we can start building out from there. And you'll usually do a lot more repetitions. And as you get closer and closer to the series part of season, you're going to do less repetitions, whether it's football track, whatever you're training for. And so it's a similar, it's the same as that philosophy in, in, in stock market investing, build a strong core first, branch out from there. And, um, and then in a matter of a few years, then you're, you're going. And especially for young people, young people are always in such a race. And I'm like, you've got time on your hands, man. You know, um, if you're 65 and you're just trying to start learning investing, uh, yeah, you know, you're kind of in a bit of a race, but for a lot of people that are probably watching this video, you're, you're, you know, twenties, thirties, you got a lot of time, make sure you're, you're working with urgency, but make sure you're getting your foundation, right? If your foundation is not right. Your house is going to collapse. It's like building a house, man. If the foundation is not right, the whole thing's going to fall in. It's just a matter of is it going to fall in next year, or the year after, or three years from now. Um, getting that foundation right will get you through the bear markets. They'll get you through the crash markets. That's what got me through last year because I've been doing this for a while. I got my foundation right, and I got hit. I got smacked last year in 2022, certainly, but I made it through to the other side and um, on to bigger and better things. So. 
that's the, that's the thing I could preach. If you could give yourself, you know, broke Jeremy, one piece of advice on the back of a lesson that you've learned, what's the, what was the lesson? What is the advice? Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's so dang many, man. So many, so many lessons. Oh gosh. Which I is, mean, I, I guess is actually great to hear because this is the reality yeah. of investing in the stock market. There's going to be some yeah. lessons. There's going to be some lessons yeah. learned. Yeah, there's going to be so many lessons. I mean, there's so many lessons I have around either mistakes I made with a stock in terms of buying a wrong stock or continuing to buy it or situations where I sold a stock way too early. Um, you know, I've held some of the greatest companies ever in. I sold a lot of those companies. NVIDIA, I used to hold shares of NVIDIA and I sold and I missed out on a 10x plus of NVIDIA shares. Monster Energy, back when it was Hanson's Natural Beverage, one of the greatest stocks in the past 20 years of being in the stock market. I held that stock. And unfortunately, as of today, I have no shares in that stock. So I've made a lot of blunders when it comes to under seeing the vision for this company. Like this is going to be huge. And then taking my profits way too soon. So there's a million of them. But the main one, I would say, you got to outwork people. You got to outwork, you know, the world's competitive. The ones who always win are the ones that outwork their competition. If you are not willing to outwork your competition, and do things that other people just won't do, you're, you're not going to advance. And, and I've seen it consistently just in my own life, never mind like friends and peers and I've seen in their lives, but I've seen it in my own life. Like in track, I always had to outwork everybody. In uh, when I worked at Walgreens, I outworked everybody so I could get at least good hours at my store. At Quick Trip, I outworked everybody. A lot of people didn't want to get up at 4 a.m. or they, you know, sometimes would slack or whatever. And I just made sure I grinded and gave it 100%. And I'd get promotions. I'd get the best bonusing store so I had more money to put in the market. Stock market investing, looking in the stocks, researching the stocks. You, you can't slack on any of this stuff because you will be beat. And, um, you know, I've I've obviously been thankful to have a tremendous amount of success on YouTube, you know, four silver play buttons. There's only one other finance creator in the world who has uh, four in the finance community has four silver play buttons. He's my neighbor. And we're the only two in the whole world that has that are in the finance community that have four silver play buttons. And it's just grind, man. you got to outwork everybody. A lot of people, you know, want to take a day off like oh, hell with this, man. Um, and you can do that and you can still have a level of success. You just got to understand, like, if you really want to push it, you, you've got to you've got to dig places in you that just other people are just like, oh no, they're crazy, man. I'm not willing to do that, and uh, and that's when you have the 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 most success, I guess you can say. And when you can look back at yourself and be like, damn, I'm proud I did that. And I can tell you, there's so much hard work I put in my life in different areas that I'm like, I'm so happy I did that because if I didn't do that, I would not be here today. If I was not you know, reading annual reports at midnight when I was 21 years old, while other people were out partying, I could tell you I wouldn't be here today. If I wasn't willing to work at Quick Trip and work those overnight shifts at stores I didn't really want to work at and bad areas and stuff like that, I can tell you I wouldn't be here. And so when you look back on your life and you realize where you're at then at that point in time, and you look back, it's like a full circle moment where you're like, damn, man, like, thank you. Thank you for putting in that grind because that was, that was worth it. That was worth it. I haven't met somebody yet that didn't work their face off and was like, oh, it didn't pay off. Every single person I ever know that like really went after it, man, over a three, five year span, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm happy I did it. It was brutal, but I'm happy I did it because it paid off and it paid off big. This video is, of course, mainly based on the stock market. But if it was you and you only had a thousand bucks to your name, which you could invest, do you think you'd be maybe better served launching a business or, or you know, maybe trying something else before you do jump directly into the stock market or a bit of both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I would get started with investing as as early as possible, unless there's some vision you have of like, this is going to work and I'm going to do this. I need to spend a thousand dollars there. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to investing and being able to make your money into money without you having to put an effort to that. As any single, as any person that has been successful in their business, what they wish they knew was how to invest. Because then imagine you build a successful business, okay? And imagine, you know, you, you sell it for $5 million. You have this great exit, okay, I made $5 million. What do you do with the $5 million? You put in a savings account now, do you try to invest it and make your money into money, right? Are you stressing because now you're like, damn, I don't know how to invest. So at the end of the day, I would always get started with investing as early as possible. Don't use, you can do a lot of things. Like people are like, well, I can't focus on this. Yes, you can. 
I used to work three jobs, run for my college full time and, and take, I don't know how many credit hours, a ton of credit hours in terms of classes and all that stuff and still had a social life and still did stock market. Like you can freaking do it. And so I would say to everybody out there, like get rolling with it ASAP. Don't make excuses. People love to make excuses. It's just, it's just an excuse. Just understand every time you say, I, I don't have time right now. Baloney. You got freaking time. You can make the time. You're not, you're not, you're choosing not to search for the time. And that's a choice you can make. Just understand the only person you're fooling is yourself. Anybody that really goes after it. <laughs> yeah. We don't make excuses like that. We're like, we'll find the time. We'll, we'll make it work. And that, that's what differentiates the people that are extremely successful from the people that are just, you know, kind of going along in life.